Welcome back to the control room of the Keck-1 telescope. Today I want to talk about a pure phenomenon of the wave-like nature of light rays. It's called interference and in particular it's interference when light passes through thin films. I think thin films. That sounds very esoteric. Actually it's not. It has some very powerful applications. Give you two examples. One is without any sophisticated measurements at all, the presence of interference effects in thin films uh, can allow you to measure thicknesses of incredibly thin sheets of material if they're transparent. Some sheets that might be a fraction of a wavelength of light, which is just normally invisible, actually you'll be able to tell what the thickness of it is with a gross macroscopic measurement, just actually looking at it sometimes, looking at the interference pattern caused by the effect we're talking about, thin film interference. Second of all, I mentioned that almost all the optics, very expensive stuff here at Keck Observatory, uses enormous numbers of very large lenses, we paid a fortune for that stuff, and before we buy them, every one of these pieces of optics, just about every one of them, has to have thin film coatings very carefully applied to it, which costs an even more fortune. There must have been hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe into the million dollar range, spent simply on putting thin layers of film on top of all these beautiful optical lenses that were designed for Keck Observatory. Why are we spending all that money? And in fact, if you go to an eye doctor, you're probably going to be asked if you want to spend that money too. Let's find out what that's about also. Thin films can be anti-reflection coatings. Those are two very practical examples, very widely used. And I love the understanding you'll get of the interference wave phenomenon of light waves uh, by understanding this. But let's go back first and think about a wave that you can see which is illustrated here. This would be a transverse wave traveling from left to right down a uh, string under tension. So you pull one section of the string up here and since it's under tension the tension pulls it back down and that pulls on the section to the right and then that pulls on the section to the right of it and then what happens and we've looked at this maybe you looked at it a little bit in physics 6b what happens when the string is connected to a thicker section of string that has more mass density, therefore more inertia. A heavy section of string, the wave is going to keep on going, it's going to plow into this <clears throat> heavier section where it meets more resistance, and what's going to happen? The pulse of the waves, and of course this could be many waves per second, but I've just shown one pulse here. This uh, wave front or wave train is going to continue traveling to the right through the heavy section of the string, but now because there's more inertia here, the forces don't cause as much of acceleration, they don't cause as much displacement, so the pulse looks like it's gotten a little weaker traveling through this heavy medium. You don't need to worry about that. Here's the important thing that I want you to be aware of, and I don't, you should review this if you, this was pointed out to you in 6b, or maybe if it was skipped over. What happens at this interface here? You're going from a lower density medium to a more resistive, heavy, <clears throat> denser medium. At this interface, at this boundary, when the light string pulls on the heavy string, Newton's, what is it, third law, action and reaction, that means that the heavy string is going to be pulling back also. If you pull the heavy string up, the light string pulls the heavy string up as the wave arrives from the left. The heavy string pulls the light string down and that generates a reflected pulse from this interface here. So the wave energy actually splits into two. Some fraction of the energy continues transmitting forward as it was going from left to right. However, some energy, and maybe you don't want this, is inadvertently here at any kind of transition interface is going to be reflected backwards. You get a reflection. And there's no mirror here actually, but it acts a little bit like a partial mirror because it's reflecting some of the light. And now here's what you have to notice. The whole point of this slide is the reflection at, if you're going from a lighter medium into a heavier, more resistive medium, the reflection, the heavier medium kind of wins, and it ends up pulling the light string down. So notice that the reflected pulse looks just like the 
incoming pulse, maybe it has a, hopefully it has a lower amplitude, and notice it's inverted. It's pulled down. This string pulls up on the heavy string, heavy string pulls the light string back down, it resists it, and sends it back. Now, just so that you, so there's a 180 degree, or if you want to call it uh, half a wavelength, Jeez. it's actually a pi in radians, but it's a half a wavelength shift between the light wave that was going in and the light wave that comes back out. It's an exact inversion of the first one. That's the key point. It's a half wavelength shift. Now, uh, let's look at this a little in two extreme cases. I'll give you two extreme cases. This happens anytime there's a change in the medium that the wave is passing through. And this also applies to light rays <clears throat> passing through a medium that might not be a vacuum. Whenever, as you see here, whenever there's a change in the thickness of the string, we get one of these boundaries that could cause a reflection. Light rays, whenever they're passing through a medium that has a changing index of refraction, where n changes, we can get we can expect generally to get a reflection at that boundary. Some will be transmitted, some will be reflected. Let's look at that in a little more detail. Here's two extreme cases on the next slide. Here, suppose that the light medium on the left is connected to such a heavy medium here on the right. I'm going to give you just an extreme case. Suppose it was just tied down here. Suppose I just tied the string down here um, so that it, there were no vibrations could happen here. It would be like an infinite index of refraction. So you'd have a, a string that was anchored, uh, just nail it down, nail the string to the wall here. Wall doesn't move at all. That's an extreme case. Then you know exactly what happens. Wave comes in, upright like this, hits the wall, is not going to cause any vibration in the wall, and the wall then by Newton's third law pulls the string back down and you get all of the power, if everything is efficient here, all of the power of the wave is 100% reflected except notice. The wall pulls it down here, and so the reflection is exactly a half a wavelength, a half integer wavelength, 180 degrees out of phase from the wave that went in. So this is the general case now. I'm going to generalize this here. Whenever you move from a low index of refraction medium to a higher index of refraction medium, you expect and predict a half wavelength shift in the reflected light. The opposite case little less obvious here. It's the so-called free reflection. Suppose that this string, um, you can do this, we could do a demonstration of this. Instead of nailing it to a wall here, I could connect it to a post that has a ring that slides freely up and down on the ring with no resistance whatever. It'd be a little hard to engineer that. But if there's a free reflection here, then the string comes up. There's, it's, free, it's moving up and down freely. There's nothing pulling it down. So the string itself pulls on itself and then will result in a so-called free reflection where the wave will then go backwards with the same energy that it came in. This is 100 percent reflection but now notice the difference between the first case. Because it was a free reflection here, because the index of refraction on the right was lower than the index of refraction on the left, that's going from a higher to a lower index of refraction, we got no inversion. We have no phase shift. The wave that comes out is exactly lined up with, it's exactly in phase or within um, one wavelength in phase, an integer number of wavelengths in phase with the wave that comes in. So reflection is in phase with the wave that comes out. No inversion happens. And so this generally is the situation if you move from a high index material to a lower index material. So just to recap what this slide shows, this is what you got to remember. In fact, this is almost all you have to remember to solve these problems. Wave, light wave, any kind of wave. This is a string wave, but of course this also applies to electromagnetic waves. Coming in from high index refraction medium to low index refraction medium, reflected wave is inverted, half a wavelength shift. Going from a low index of refraction medium, sorry, from a high index of refraction medium into a low index of refraction medium, no reflection. The wave comes back out exactly with the same in phase that it came in with. All right? So, no problems so far. Let's look at an interesting case, though. Suppose that some of the wave is reflected and some of it is transmitted, 
and then suppose that there's a second boundary. So we have two changes in the index of a fraction. So we have the uh, incoming index of a fraction, then we go through a very thin, small region where there's a new index of a fraction, and then we get to the end of that thin film, and there's another third index of a fraction. Or maybe we're back to the original index of a fraction. What's going to happen then? Two reflections. You got it? There's going to be a reflection from the first transition or boundary, the first change in index of fraction, and then there's going to, some of the light will go through that thin film and be reflected from the back side. So there's some reflection from the front side of the thin film, and then also some reflection from the back side of the film. If you can understand this slide here, you pretty much have got the whole story. There's a lot going on here, so let's look at this fairly carefully. This is an actual problem. This could be an actual exam problem. I've seen these, I've used these. This is sort of an MCAT type problem. We have, let's say that we have light rays coming in straight across from the left, and pretty realistic case here. That, of course, has an index or fraction of 1. It's pretty close to a vacuum. It's air. We'll just call that index or fraction of 1.0. Then let's suppose that somebody, for reasons that we'll see in a minute, has carefully coded a uniform layer of transparent gunk. Um, the gunk, for example, might be a layer of magnesium fluoride. I think that's the formula for it. Mag fluoride is a very nice coating to put on glass. Notice that it has a higher index of refraction than the air. It's about 1.38. And so then we know, from what I was just showing you, that a little bit, some fraction of the incoming light is going to reflect off of the front surface back here. I can't really stop that. We might not be thrilled about that, but that is going to happen. However, some of it, maybe the bulk of it, is transmitted through the coating until, and this is a thin coating, of thickness T. should have drawn this here. This thickness of this pink layer is going to be a thickness T. could be a very small number, a fraction of a millimeter. Anyway, after traveling through this thickness T, it gets to a new boundary here where it hits the glass. And since I picked the optician, actually. I couldn't do this, probably to save my life. It takes years of training and blah, blah, blah. But after it travels through the magnesium fluoride coating, then it hits a higher index of reflection for glass, which would be about one and a half. So twice now there's going to be reflection. Once going from 1 to 138, that was going up sends a reflection here, and then going from the 138 and the mag fluoride, hitting the glass, another reflection, and both of these reflections have the same property. And the two examples I gave last time were going in both cases from a low index to a higher index. Lower index, higher index. What happens when you reflect off of a higher index barrier? What happens to the wave that's reflected back at you? Half a wavelength shift. Inversion happens. This one's inverted, and that reflected wave is also inverted. So there's a reflected wave from the front surface, reflection one, and there's a reflection also coming back at you from the back surface, reflection two. The difference is, there's two differences to these. First of all, ref, um, they've both been inverted. They've both been shifted by a half a wavelength from what they were when they came in. Okay, that turned out to not be a difference here because we just set it up so we have both reflections were going from low end to high end. But there's a second difference. Look at how much path the two light rays have followed. They both came, they came in here. One of them hit the pink reflective coating. It's not actually pink. It should be, well, hopefully it's transparent. And it came back out immediately. The second one had to travel further. It traveled a distance t going to the back of the coating. It traveled all the way to thickness t, and then it had to come back. If these are roughly perpendicular uh, coming in, then it travels back an extra path length of approximately 2t. 2t is the extra path length traveled by the second light rays. And now here's where the fun part comes. Light rays 1 and 2 started out as in-phase light. Then 
they were both inverted by half a wavelength, so the reflected light would still be in phase except for the fact that light 2 has an additional path length that it traveled, which was 2t. So now there's a difference between light ray 1 and 2 of 2t of path length. They can now, because they're both waves, it's the same wave, they started out in phase, they could now, as they come back out, and you're looking at them, suppose your eyeball is sitting back out here or your measuring instrument is back here, 1 and 2 can now, since they're pure waves, they can interfere with each other. And in this particular question, you've got to read the questions carefully, we're asking for the condition, this is a fascinating one, the one I'm most interested in, where 1 and 2 could totally, destructively interfere with each other. Isn't that amazing? That's what I'm saying is that if the thickness of this coating were chosen to be just right and could be uh, manufactured exact to exact specifications, then the extra path 2T here could correspond to exactly the phase shift needed to make 2 be exactly 180 degrees out of phase with 1 so if we do this right, the reflections from the two surfaces, reflection, front surface reflection 1 and the back surface reflection 2, could, in principle, and this actually happens, could totally cancel each other out so that you would see no reflection. There's two reflections, but they would go away. We would see nothing. Isn't that kind of magic? Total destructive interference here if we have picked the right thickness of the magnesium fluoride. What thickness do we need here? We need this extra path traveled by ray 2 to be, for example, a half a wavelength of the light that's coming in. I'm assuming that the light all has one fixed wavelength here for simplicity. Let's say it's green light, 500 nanometers for example. That's a particular wavelength of light and if you delay the light by 2t, if that corresponds for example to a half a wavelength of light, in other words if this thickness was just a quarter of a wavelength because it has to go down and back, then light ray 2, the second reflection would have picked up quarter wavelength down, quarter wavelength back, it would have picked up a half a wavelength shift exactly canceling out, being exactly out of phase with the light from the front surface 1. So and of course, it would also work, by the way, if it were exactly three halves of a wavelength out of phase. Remember, that will also give total destructive interference. Or five halves out of wavelengths out of phase. Any half integer number of wavelengths. So what's the condition? Half integer number of wavelengths. I think that we're looking for a condition either four or five. We need twice the thickness, that's the extra path traveled by light ray 2, to be a half integer number of wavelengths of light longer, in which case we'll have total destructive interference. The only question, and this is where people often make mistake, I've made this mistake before, uh, you might lose a point on this if you're not careful with this on the exam, what wavelength are we talking about now? We're not talking about the original incoming wavelength of the light when it was in air. We, if we want to design this coding correctly, we need to think of the wavelength where? The wavelength of the wave as it travels through this extra path, 2t. And the wavelength there, remember, is going to be compressed by the index of refraction ratio, so we need to calculate the wavelength in the magnesium fluoride medium, because that's where this extra path length is happening. So the correct answer to this multiple choice question, you already narrow it down to four or five. Actually, correct answer is five. You have to take into account the wavelength, and which is easy to do, once I tell you that the index of refraction of magnesium fluoride is 1.38. That's it. So what have we just invented? By cleverly coating this glass with a magnesium fluoride very thin film layer, it might be a so-called quarter of a wavelength coating, 
we now have a possibility of eliminating the reflection. It certainly will greatly reduce the reflected light you see. It's an anti-reflection coating. That sounds really cool and very practical in situations, especially situations with fine optics and delicate amounts of light, such as an astronomer faces all the time. We or we don't want any reflection at all. We want to minimize it with an anti-reflection coating. And we're willing to pay a lot of money for someone to very carefully lay down a nice precision coating of a uniform thickness on our already very expensive glass lens. That's what we do. That's what you do probably when you get order a pair of glasses. And here's another example, slightly different from the example that we talked about before, but it's the same basic principles. Could you get an idea, as I mentioned before, of what the thickness of a soap bubble film surface would be? They're very, how do I know that they're very thin? Because I have seen, and you have seen, everybody has seen, interference patterns when you have a very thin layer of soap. And, uh, you know, every time you play around in the bathtub with lots of soap bubbles, you get these very thin films of soap bubbles, and it's approximately described by this diagram on the left here. That'd be a fun assignment for Physics 6C students. Go play around, find a lab partner, possibly, and play around with soap bubbles in the bath. Um, you can keep your clothes on, I guess, if it's, you know, we don't want to get into anything kinky here. And you'll have a situation fairly similar to this. Here is the layer of soap. It's a very thin layer. Maybe it's soap water. And here's the important point. It has a higher index of refraction than the air on either side of it. Here's the air on the outside of the bubble, and here's the air on the inside of the bubble. And the index of refraction of the soap water, let's say, just making up a number here, is about 1.35 for our particular problem. So there's a thin layer surrounded by air on both sides. We gonna get interference effects with this thin film? Looks a little different from the thin film coating that I put on a glass lens. That was a, that was a case where we went from air, higher index of refraction, even higher index of refraction. Now I'm going air, that's a low index, one, higher index, back to air again, lower. So I'm going low, high, low instead of low, high, higher. So I think something's going to be different here, but in principle, yes, there can still be a interference between, because we got two reflections again. I got two transitions in the index of refraction here, from 1 to 135, and then from 135 to 1 here, both of which are going to produce reflected rays. So there's the first reflected way coming off the front surface. Since we're going from lower to higher, what happens to it? Phase inversion. The first ray that comes back is half a wavelength out of phase with the original light. The transmitted wave is not inverted. It goes back to the back side, and now it experiences, not the case before with the glass, it experiences a so-called free reflection. It hits a lighter, a lower index of refraction medium on the back side, so it inverts and is reflected with no phase shift at all. So there was a half a wavelength phase shift here, no phase shift here. Got that? So now we look at the first reflection and the second reflection, and like I said, this one is a half a wavelength shifted, this one is not shifted at all, so if I ignored the thickness of the soap film, it looks like they would exactly cancel each other out, which is true because there'd be no reflection if there was no soap bubble, so that makes logical sense. Or if there was virtually no soap bubble, there'd be no reflection. However, the difference is not just a half a wavelength, it's also the distance traveled here. 2t is the thickness. How many wavelengths is that? How many wavelengths in the soap film? In other words, how many lambda sub n wavelengths of additional path length did the second uh, light ray travel. So there's the path it took. In this case, 
we're asking for the opposite question, the previous one. I'm asking, you got to read these carefully, I'm asking for the condition for constructive interference. I'm asking for the condition that this second wave that comes out is a integer number of wavelengths different, shifted, from the first reflected wavelength. Well, just from the reflections, this being um, an inverted reflection, this being a free reflection, just from the reflections alone, there's already, they're already half a wavelength out of phase, which is bad. That's, that's going to be destructive. But if I could also add a half a wavelength of phase shift as the second ray travels down through the film and back, that's a distance 2t, if the distance 2t was also a half a wavelength shift, then you'd have a half a wavelength shift for the reflections and a half a wavelength shift for the traveling across the film and a half a wavelength and a half a wavelength would be add up to an integer number of wavelength shifts and an integer number of wavelength shifts is the condition for constructive additive interference. They'll reinforce each other. They'll be exactly in phase and so you get a strong bright reflection if this condition here is satisfied. So we need the 2t path length traveling through the soap film and back at a wavelength n, that's the wavelength uh, traveling through a medium of n equals 1.35. There's your, uh, the wa original wavelength might be 540 nanometers, but it's going to be squished traveling through this film. If that additional path length is, it could be a half a wavelength or any half integer, m, m is an integer here, so it could be three halves, that's one plus a half, or two plus a half, five halves, seven halves, any half integer number of wavelengths. If that's two times the thickness, we're going to get a constructive interference, and the two sides reflections will reinforce each other, and we'll get, in this case, bright green light. So in a typical problem here, I might ask you, what is the thinnest soap bubble? What's the smallest value of T? that could give you this constructive interference condition. Hmm. All right, if it's the thinnest medium, then this, we, it could, in principle, still satisfy the constructive interference criterion even if there was only just a half wavelength shift. So the smallest thickness could be m equals zero. You could have larger thicknesses, but if m equals zero, that'd be my condition. So my condition would be 2t equals just a half times the wavelength of the light in the soap. And you can see then, let's see, I want to know what t is, the smallest t here. So if 2t is a half lambda n, then the solution for this would be just t, divide by 2, t is a quarter lambda n. What is lambda n? Lambda n is 540 nanometers divided by 1.35, so that's the way we pick these numbers here. The lambda, the wavelength as it travels through the thin film here would be, I think, around 400 nanometers. 400 nanometers times 1 fourth would give you a thickness of 100 nanometers, an incredibly thin soap bubble, which will still produce these interference effects. So that's another example, and that's pretty much the two kinds of examples that I'm going to give you. Um, here's exactly the opposite problem. These are very interesting if you want to measure very small spacings between plates. This is exactly the opposite situation. Before, again, I have two reflections. The light, let's say that these are, I don't know, glass sheets that are very close together. So it's, it seems like it's exact opposite of my soap bubble case. I have the light traveling through a high index of refraction medium. It's traveling here. Let's look at the blow up of this region. It's traveling through the high index medium glass. Then there's a small air gap. Air gap. We can measure a very small air gap here. And so at any change of index of refraction, we're going from one and a half to one. This is air here. So the index of refraction suddenly dropped. We get a first reflection off of the front of the air gap. But a lot of the light will continue traveling across the air gap, travels down, and then it hits the second glass surface. So we're going from a low index, 1, to back to a high index, 1.5, and we get a reflection that way. So ray 2 goes back up 
they both bend by the same amount, so they'll be heading off in the same direction. The only there, there are two differences then between ray one and ray two. Ray one, when it got to the first surface here, going from high end to low end, was not inverted. It's a free reflection, so there's no wavelength shift for ray one. Ray two, it went from a high index to from a low index air to glass. It's inverted. It's the opposite situation of the soap bubble, but the point is the same. The rays are now, because this one didn't get inverted and the second one did get inverted, they're half a wavelength out of phase plus second phenomenon. Ray 2 had to travel across this gap. Now it's called D instead of T, distance instead of thickness, same thing. It had to travel down and back, so it had to travel the distance 2D. So we've got the condition then for constructive interference turns out to be the same as the condition that we had before with the soap bubble film. We have to make this 2D path, we have to make that work out to be a half wavelength or a half integer number of wavelength shift. Then it will compensate for the fact that this was a free inversion and this was an inverted a free reflection and this was an inverted reflection, it'll exactly compensate for the half a wavelength shift and so there'll be integer wavelength shift or no wavelength shift and we get a bright constructive interference. So this basically is the same condition that we wrote down before. This is what 2D has to be in wavelengths and um, M you know, there, you can always, you get constructive interference if you're exactly one wavelength out of phase, two, three, four, as long as it's an integer number. That's why M could be one, two, three, four, whatever. And then, of course, if the opposite could happen, too. If the thickness D was different so that it only provide, so that it provided a full wavelength shift, then the fact that this was not inverted and this was inverted would lead to total destructive interference, a dark band, destructive interference. And that corresponds to another half wavelength shift here. There's the condition. Now, what you actually see when you look at one of these air gaps, you notice that they've got it tilted here. So it's coming up at an angle. So if you look at different places, even if the change, as you, as you go along here, here the air gap is D. Here it's a little bit less than D. Here it's a little bit more than D. D could be an incredibly small air gap. I mean, you realize when you put two pieces of glass together, there's a little bit of air between them, a little bit of a gap, even too small for you to see it. This interference effect will let you know and infer and measure the air gap. And if they're tilted a little bit, maybe you're doing a really precise manufacturing job and you don't want these two glass sheets to be tilted. But if they are tilted, then as you go from here, where the separation is D, here it's a little more than D, here it's a little less than D, you will go back and forth between constructive interference and destructive interference. There's your constructive interference, where the gap was the desired thickness, then the gap is a little more, the gap is a little less, and you're going back and forth between these two conditions. You will see an interference pattern as you look vertically down uh, these two almost touching glass plates because they have a little wedge of air pocket in there. You may have to go and re-engineer them, actually, it's a, unless that's what you designed, in which case you can see how widely spaced they are, and you can see if the air gap tilt is designed the way you wanted it to. Very clever for you. And all of the things I've been describing now, of course, we're looking at just one wavelength. You might do this with a pure laser light, which has one wavelength coming in, um, and then you're only measuring at that wavelength. That was certainly what was happening in, in this soap film example I gave you and this air gap example. I was just fixing one input wavelength. But in nature, of course, you often are sending white light through um, a thin film, and it gets reflected the different wavelengths, of course, will have different interference patterns because white light is a combination of short and long wavelengths. And so this is pretty familiar. Um, certain gaps in a thin, here's a rather complicated thin film. I think this actually may be from some kind of insect wing. You know, insect wings are like a thin 
sort of soap bubble sheet. There's air on both sides, very thin film through it. And they're so thin that they're like just a fraction of light. But it depends on whether you're talking about red light or blue light, which has like half the wavelength of red light. And so you'll get these gorgeous, con here's a construct of interference of a long wavelength. They, they add in phase. And then right next to it is a construct of interference of the short wavelengths, the blue light. So you get these beautiful uh, interference patterns which depend on the wavelength of the light going through and that causes iridescence in a number of uh, natural biological systems. And who knows, uh, in some cases this may help them find mates or something, I, I don't know. So th there's some evolutionary pressures on having this happen, aside from it being a totally cool physics experiment that evolution has been performing. Um, all right, so this is basically the same thing that I showed you before. It, oh, here the gap, instead of called D on the last slide, here the gap is called T. That's nice. And you get the point is that you'll see a different spacing of bright, that's constructive interference, dark, destructive uh, interference, constructive, destructive, constructive. You get a different pattern at different wavelengths of light. This doesn't show it perfectly. Um, all right, so I don't think that slide adds much to our understanding from the previous slide, except to point out the interference pattern will be shifted to waves. Practical example: this, you've surely all we've all seen an extremely thin layer of oil floating on water. For example, oil floats; it's a little less dense, has a different index of refraction from water, and so. Uh, like uh, uh, like oil slick after rain or something, you have a very thin layer of oil there. And so what you notice is that it's not usually uh, different wavelengths of light then interfere constructively and destructively at different places. That's why you get these really cool, almost psychedelic rainbow effects where the oil slick will look red in one place and then green in one place, yellow and blue in different places. That's because those are different wavelengths of light which have different regions, different locations of destructive and constructive interference. All right, there's a worked example. Shall we do this? Right. Let's do this really quickly then for thin plates. Now, right now these actually, for, for in this case, these two plates could be parallel for all I care. I'm not interested in the fact that they're tilted, really. I'm just going to look at the light that goes through where there's an air gap here of T. So like these could be parallel plates too. We might want to measure the air gap between parallel plates. Anyway, we're sending the light rays almost straight down here at 500 nanometers. That's green light. Nano meters being 10 to the minus 9 meters, in case you forgot. And the light comes in through the first glass and then is reflected without inversion off of the first top of the air gap, then travels a distance t and is inverted when it reflects off of the glass here, travels back another distance t. It's traveled 2t now. That's the same as we had before. And if you want constructive interference, as we saw before, the 2t extra distance of the second light wave has to be exactly a half a wavelength out of phase with the first one, so a half integer number of wavelengths. What is this, the wavelength? Is this lambda n? Think about it. It's the wavelength in the gap. Well, the wavelength in the gap here is the wavelength in air. It's an air gap here, and so the index of refraction is 1, so the wavelength is just the wavelength in air. The wavelength in air, we said, we were told, was 500 nanometers. So there's your condition for constructive interference, and so we could work that, that condition out if you wanted to plug and chug some numbers. Now let's see, here's a slightly more interesting case. Ugh. Actually, kind of a typical sort of MCAT type problem. They give you extraneous information to confuse you, because life is like that. MCATs are like it. Uh, maybe just a little bit worse than real life. We have a 500 nanometer wave coming in, then it travels through, well, this isn't glass, it's a sheet of uh, plastic that's transparent, happens to have an index of refraction a little less than glass, it's 1.4. And then just to make it a little bit fancier here, ugh, we have a, this is more like a soap layer, we have a transmission of grease, which was put in between these two sheets, which is 1.5. Ah, darn, this looks exactly like the geometry we saw in the original magnesium fluoride coating. 
the light is going from a lower N index first, it encounters a higher one and gets reflected with inversion, and then it encounters a still higher one, a special kind of glass, flint glass, that's even a higher ref uh, index refraction than silicone grease, so it's reflected here, again, with inversion. So this one is inverted, 180 degrees, half a wavelength. This one also inverted, 180 degrees, half a wavelength. So then they will be in phase as long as we only add a integer number of wavelengths traveling across this gap. In other words, as long as 2t is an integer number of wavelengths, m, an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, number of wavelengths, except it's the number of wavelengths inside the gap inside the silicone grease. Oops, that should be a 1.5 there. All right, 1.5. There, like that better. All right, that's the so-called lambda n, where the gap is happening. All right, and you could actually put in some numbers here and get the right answer if we're doing an exam problem. All right, so just to kind of recap what I started out with here, here's one of the mega applications for these thin film interference effects. Getting back to destructive interference, a very common situation the hear opticians talking about a lot is let's just put the thinnest, that's the cheapest, uh, uh, uniform layer of coating on an optics of glass, such as a fancy glass lens. Actually, I have one right here, just to show you what we want to do. It's a pretty nice pair of glasses. You know why we pay extra amount of money for these lenses here is it's very distracting when someone is wearing glasses and lights are just reflecting off of them back into your eyes. You can't look at my eyes. You can, you're just ending up seeing reflections off of the glass. Those are called uh, optical ghosts. It's not the light you want to see. You want to see the light from my eyes uh, behind the glass. So it is very common, um, and I certainly did it on these glasses, you know, being into optics. I paid the extra money to have an anti-reflection coating on these glasses. You probably did too, although some of you all are students. You haven't <clears throat> started pulling in the big bucks yet after med school. And uh, this cost me, I don't know, at least a hundred extra bucks here. But it, it makes the glasses just look nicer. Basically when people look at you through the glasses, they're a little bit less aware that there's a glass sheet between you and them, which, which is kind of psychologically off-putting. So we like ref anti-reflection coatings. And if you're dealing with delicate optics uh, where you want to measure faint light, the reflections could be fatal. For example, in a telescope, if we're, um, we have a camera in the telescope and the light doesn't go through to our detector, but some of it is reflected off, then it may get reflected off of something else. And this is a classic problem in, in cameras. This produces reflected light image, not the one you were trying to take. You were trying to take a picture of the direct light coming through, the transmitted light. You get these unwanted reflection images which will appear on your film or your camera detector which are called ghosts. Ghosts are generally bad. We don't want that. You certainly would like to design a system that has no ghosts or as, small, as faint ghosts as possible and that's the purpose of this anti-reflection coating. If you had a film which was a quarter of a wavelength thick. Now I'm talking about the wavelength of light when it's passing through the film. So that's lambda n. Then as we said before, just to remind you, then you pick up a quarter of a wavelength here. You pick going down to here. You pick another quarter of a wavelength coming back. That's a half a wavelength. So it's this second reflection here is now exactly out of phase with the first reflection. Oops, what about the reflections at the surfaces? No, they were both inverted the same here. Half a wavelength here, half a wavelength here. That cancels out because we're going from low n, higher n, higher still n. So there's a half wavelength of inversion here, half wavelength inversion here. The only thing we, they're inverted the same. The only thing we need to do here is to have the second one have an additional half a wavelength distance to travel and then you'll get hopefully perfect destructive cancellation, destructive interference, and if you do this right, at least if you're looking straight down on it, there'll be no reflection at all. 
Now, of course, if you look at a high angle here, actually the distance traveled would be a bit more than t, right? It's a slanting across there. It might be I don't know, 20% more there, 20% more there. So then it might not work. But at least this ought to work pretty well. If you And you might, just it depends on what wavelength you design this for, you might design it for the middle of the visible range. So the anti-reflection coating will not, if you just do a simple coating like this, will not necessarily work for all wavelengths. But um, it might work, you know, if you're looking straight on at a roughly visible light, say about 500 nanometers, that's how opticians would usually design things. By the way, we're not going to do this in this class, but a really fun thing to do, like if you want to make uh, photography filters, is to put multiple layers, multiple thin films on here, each of which is uh, destroying different wavelengths of light. And if you put, like, for example, in a typical uh, multiple coating, you lay these, de you uh, deposit these in a vacuum chamber on a piece of glass, you could lay down eight, ten, twelve different thin film coatings here, and if you design this carefully with light indices refraction, you can design it, for example, so that all of the wavelengths are reflected and only um, maybe a narrow range of wavelengths, like one particular kind of red light, would be transmitted. You could make an interference filter this way. This is very useful in astronomy and a lot of uh, technical measurements where you want to only allow, you take a combination of thin films which will only allow one wavelength um, to be reflected or, or transmitted. So I love anti-reflection coatings and I think that's a good time to stop the lecture.